Hello and welcome to Nailing It Down, um, a barn blog production. And today in our series on understanding key concepts, we're returning to Marx's theory of alienation. This is inspired by a conversation I have with a friend of mine who chastised me for not focusing on this enough because it's crucial to understand and it's also crucial to combine with other theories to get a working nature of the way class is both mentionable, we always talk about it in America, and unmentionable simultaneously. We're going to start with alienation. A concept uh, in German comes from the word uh, Entfremdung, which I'm certainly mispronouncing. My German has degraded over time, and I apologize about that, uh, which is a theory of estrangement. Now, this is um, something that was in Hegelian circles all along. This theory of estrangement, uh, while not specifically from Hegel, is implied in the phenomenology of spirit and, you know, the kind of negative reality or negative self-realization and in the master-slave dialectic. But it really gets developed more completely in Ludwig Feuerbach's uh, Essence of Christianity in 1841. Um, Feuerbach sees estrangement from nature, estrangement that in the phenomenological sense, when man realizes that that and and you know we're going to have to use the original pronouns, but when human beings realize that um, they are both removed from from nature by their awareness of it and their awareness of themselves, and part of it, uh, Thurbach thinks that alienation leads to constructing a mental universe that puts man back in the center through the the creation of God. This is kind of the one of your basic enlightenment um, stories of the creation of Christianity and was very much part of like left Hegelianism before Marx. Marx takes this in another direction, though. It originally comes up in the economic and philosophic manuscripts of 1844, um, where Marx talks about estrangement from the self. Now, the idea of a supernatural God alienated from the natural characteristics of the human being, but expressing them in Thurbach is where the idea initially comes from, but it is developed very differently in Marx's sort of social materialist view of history. Now, if you are an Althusserian um, or an anti-Hegelian Marxist, there's theories about an epistemic break that causes Marx to move away from this. I will just say there's not a lot of textual evidence for that. Um, we can see then this really coming to fruition in Marx's... Uh, Philosophical Propositions and the German Ideology that he wrote with Engels, and which is aimed at, mostly at Max Stirner. Now, the thing to deal with with Marx's alienation is Marx puts the particular form of proletarian alienation specific to capitalism in a particular place. All right? It is not that there are not non-capitalist alienations. In fact, most of them are common forms of law are in the class as legally defined as opposed to economically defined, right? But what Marx argues is that in capitalist society, the productive elements of work and thus the workers who make those elements are removed from their labor. Now, in the production of commodities, this is absolutely clear. You produce a commodity, you don't get that commodity back. Um, 
that commodity instead is sold by the owner of the factory who also gave you the raw material. Arguably, then, the petty proprietor would not be alienated from their labor, but we'll get into why that's not entirely the case here. But for the proletariat, um, the worker expresses themselves through their labor. You are what you make. All right. But when the worker is made an instrument, um, are treated as an instrument and not a person, i.e. as a thing, as a commodity itself through the commodity of their labor power, um, you can see this is a problem. And this really comes up in Marx's piece, A Comment on James Meal from 1844. Let us suppose that we had an individual... Excuse me, let me read this correctly. Um, let us suppose that we had carried out production as human beings. Each of us have in two ways affirmed himself and the other person. And my production would have objectified my individuality, its specific character, and therefore enjoyed not only an individual manifestation of my life during the activity, but also looking at the object, I would have the individual pleasure of knowing that my personality to be objective, visible to the senses, and hence a power beyond all doubt. And your enjoyment or use of my product, I would have direct enjoyment of both being conscious of having satisfied of human need by my work, that is, of having objectified man's essential nature, and of having created an object corresponding to the need of another man's essential nature. Our product would be so many mirrors in which we see our reflected our essential natures. All right. This is part of species being. All right, our species essence. Katumweizen. All right, I think that's how you pronounce that. Um, and species being or species essence is modified, not just in capital society, but in all class societies. All right. By limitations put on an individual given their function in the system. So it's not just say, like, a relatively equal status hierarchy of which you can w climb up or down, it is actually you have a fundamental function that you are limited to. And thus, your full expression of what you are as a being is limited. Now, Marx talks about this in four ways. One, you are alienated from your product. You do not determine in a capitalist society as a worker what the product is and how it is produced. And in fact, the efficiencies and division of labor have made that impossible. Plus, the fact that any value that is recouped from its cell is, is not directly gone to you because you have already been paid for your labor power means that you do not enjoy the expression of labor as part of your personality. All right. So instead of worrying about how something gets its use, we are worried about how it generates value as part of investment capital. All right. So not only are you removed from your product, you are also removed from the proceeds of your product. And this is not happy making. Furthermore, in the capitalist mode of production, there's a second kind of alienation. Degeneration is accomplished with an endless sequence of discrete repetitive motions that offer the worker little psychological satisfaction. This is particularly true in, say, factory work and in industrial capital, but it's even true in like agrarian capitalism or in service sector capital today, you are managed to efficiency and your labor power is reduced to wages, which has an exchange value, but you are estranged from the whole of the process. There's no feeling pride in what you do if what you do is that removed from you and you're not the primary one benefiting. All right. And Marx describes this 
in the philosophic and, ex and economic manuscripts of, eight, of 1844 as follows. The worker does not feel content, but unhappy, does not develop freely his physical and mental energies, but mortifies his body and ruins his mind. The worker, therefore, only feels outside of his work and in his and feels outside of himself. So if you think about this, even when you do something you love, when you do it for a wage or when you're told to do it and you are made to do it, the love diminishes over time. It is not an expression of your own creation. So not only are you alienated from the product, you're alienated from the process of making the product, which is why there's a lot of romanticism about artisan work, which is not efficient. It's often authentic only in its imperfections. It's often not standardized. Sometimes there's shoddy workmanship. But there's a feeling like, at least in that system, you are in so, you know, as an artist and you are in such control of what you make that there is an investment of yourself and of your prior labor in the creation of a thing or in the maintenance of a service. All right, now this is where things get a little more complicated. Marx also talks about alienation from your species essence or your species being or your human nature. All right, now this one's a, a, a bigger thought. One, while Marx is a, some might argue a, a social determinist or he believes that there are social constraints and limitations on people's ability to express all of their nature in such a way that it makes it hard to know what species being ultimately is, that the way we produce our, ourselves under capitalism in specific alienates us from other elements that are natural to us. So there are whole parts of the human person that aren't expressed because of the way we most socially reproduce ourselves under these constraints. Now, again, social reproduction is not unique to capitalism. If people tell you that, they don't really understand what's, what's going on. So there are economic and relations of production. All right, relations of productions are how the classes orient themselves and how they justify that. All right, so we can talk about, for example, um, relations of production are not just superstructural. They're also in the base of production. They are how we relate to each other in labor. All right, how this is all organized. And there are modes of production, our means of production, and there are like sub periodizations, are kind of things that change within them. So you have different kinds of feudalism, our tributarism, our, you know, whatever you would call that period, which subsides into primitive accumulation of capital, a la mercantilism and agrarian capitalism are the enclosures which then gets taken into industrial production um and these orders are often superseded by both the economic and the legal bureaucratic structures that come before it so for example there's a reason that maybe nations evolve along bureaucratic lines, even in places like in the Creole Americas, where those bureaucratic lines were not created by the people fighting the revolution, but were maintained and identified with. So you think about the states in, in, in the 13 colonies are the the early states in the Spanish empire that break off to become the various Latin American countries, they aren't, they, they really kind of core line with administrative districts and with economic modes. Right. So there you go. Um, the, this requires changes in the way we interact with each other and a justification of a system of values, which 
will limit what parts of ourselves we can express. All right. Hunter, and I think Marx is actually onto something before this is even really properly understood. Hunter gatherer societies, for example, if they're immediate return, and that, and I'm going to put the asterisk. There are problems with this categorization of hunter gatherer, but there is a. It is clearly something that we know how to talk about. Our pastoralist societies um, are another example. Are relatively egalitarian. Um, agricultural societies have some egalitarian variants, but they tend to develop standing armies to protect themselves from. Not so much from hunter-gatherers, but more from pastoralists. Um, and there you go. All right. These kinds of societies produce similar kinds of things in people because they bring out different elements of our human nature. And that is part of the alienation spoken about. And we can talk a lot more specifically about this now because while anthropology might have its origins in colonialism, it has actually illustrated a lot of the trends and development and the way that we interact in relations of production and the way that we share surplus and the way that we react to geographical limitations and the way we reproduce what we do, um, we can see that different parts of human beings are incentivized. It's not that it is totally determined by this, but the most likely outcomes are kind of probabilistically limited by the kinds of social organizations of which your daily labor goes in to creating. Now, and again, that's not unique to capitalism, but in capitalism, we see it pretty clearly because we have to justify an economic order that requires the private ownership of things like land, which is not created by anyone um, even the improvement theory of John Locke doesn't really hold water. If you study historically, that's not how uh, land was divvied up. And I, I, I think it's fair to say Locke knew that. Um, so part of the relations of production and of the limitations on your species being is that if you're going to be alienated from the product of your labor. Like if you're contributing to something beyond yourself, we're not all petty proprietors. Um, you should have say, and I would say equal say, um, in how all that is used. So in theory, in a communist society, everybody has a say in the planning. Each worker works according to their abilities, meaning that if some people can't work, they don't. Um, but their work is dignified, and they benefit each worker according to their needs. This is the goal of a communist society. Each worker can direct their labor towards productive work suitable to their own innate abilities. Um but we're not aimed at maximizing profits for someone else. And everyone in theory in the society would have equal input into the planning process, at least in how it is orientated, right? Even if you need specialists to do parts of the planning. And lastly, capitalism alienates workers from each other because it puts them in a kind of rarefied competition in a competitive labor market, because they are also, their labor power is a commodity. All right? And in that commodity, they have to struggle against each other, even at times where if co co cooperation would actually benefit everyone in society more. This is part of the game theoretical stuff I do. So it turns what is a non-zero-sum game into a zero-sum game, to use game theoretic language. Marx doesn't use that kind of language, so I'll use I'll use Marx's language. Um, it it creates relations of production that put workers against each other in competition for higher wages, alienating them from mutual economic interests. And the effect is quote false consciousness. This is the only time Marx really talks about this, and this is really more picked up by Lukash. But so, for example. 
your immediate ends are actually not in line when your long-term ends, you might compete between sectors of employers or even with somebody else in your office when if you stood together, you would stand a better chance against the boss. All right, this is another fourth kind of alienation. Now, um, if we see this as going back to Hegel, let's let's talk about how Hegel inspired uh, Feuerbach and why that's important for Marx. So, um, Todd. Uh, Han Dietrich um, in the Oxford Encyclopedia of Philosophy points out that for Hegel, the uh, unhappy consciousness is divided against itself, separated from its essence, which is placed in the beyond, right? What does that mean? Well, in, in Hegel, you, you're, your consciousness is unhappy because you see yourself reflected in someone else who is also not you. And in that realization, that negative space causes you to thrive, to define who you are. And that is the unhappy consciousness that creates our understanding of ourselves. Um, in, in the German ideology, Karl Marx says something kind of different, but is related. So in part one, for a buck opposition of the materialist and idealist outlook in German ideology, Karl Marx says the following. Things I have now come that come to pass that individuals must appropriate the existing totality of productive forces, not only to achieve self self activity, but also merely to safeguard the very existence. So that we have to forego our self actualization are limited to what we do outside of work in most cases because we do not fully and cannot fully identify with our work because we are not the only people profiting for it in fact we're primarily not profiting from it we are contributing to it as a commodity which is not something that marx would argue feels good for people to do now this is going to lead to all kinds of questions does this still apply to the service sector? Marx doesn't answer that. Although in parts of theories of surplus value in his letters, he talks about the service sector being semi-lumpenized, but that's because it has inconsistent pay at this time period and done in piecework. It doesn't have steady salary. Um, but he also talks about uh, services as generating commodities because they generate values and are sold as commodities. And he, he mentions the teacher who might work in for the state in one minute and then go work for a private section doing tutoring the next. And if so, and, and if someone collects a fee other than him and pays him a wage for that tutoring, he has made a commodity. It's an abstract commodity, but it is one. And so services are still part of that. There's no easy way to parse this out. And in fact, this is often a criticism of this theory. But I ask you, is your socialism really trying to deal with the problem of alienation as Marx defined it? Is it trying to empower people to have control over their productive part of their lives and to see that as expressed? And even if they are giving it up or letting it be manifest in greater planning they are doing so uh with an equal power basis and say in that planning because that is strongly implied in this theory and it is largely unaddressed The idea that a socialist state, if there needs to be one, would address this would also imply that democracy is will and for the worker and the worker's will is expressed in that state. If the workers rebel against that state, cannot be said to be the case. And if the goal in communism is a stateless society where this is done through social arrangement because the state implies violence, implies 
surplus going to maintain a class of people who can maintain that violence and thus that rule and that standing army. This is in Lenin's standing revolution, after all. How do you get there? And what does it mean to put this in practice now? Are we just talking about electing, you know, Democrats and labor politicians to reduce income inequity? Would that do anything about alienation? According to Marxist theory, and the answer is no. I dare you to go read the economic, uh, the philosophical and economic manuscripts of, of 1844 and the German ideology and tell me that this is not the case. And in fact, by the way, Marx doesn't just think that proletarians are alienated. In fact, in the Holy Family, in chapter 4, in 1845, Marx says that the capitalists are also alienated. The property class and the class of the proletariat present the same human self-estrangement. Right? A alienation is another way to translate the word. It's the same word in German. But the formal class feels at ease and strengthened by this self-estrangement. It recognizes estrangement as its own power and adds its semblance in, of a human existence. The class of the proletariat feels annihilated, means that they cease to exist in this estrangement. It sees in its own powerlessness and its reality of an inhuman existence. It is, to use the expression of Hegel, in its abasement, and the indignation of that abasement, an indignation to which it is necessarily driven by the contradiction between human nature and its condition of life, which is outright, resolute, and comprehensive negation of that nature. Within this antithesis, the private property owner is therefore the conservative side and the proletariat the destructive side. For the former arises the action of preserving the antithesis, thus forming the action of, of annihilating it. And think about when you deal with the rich, particularly the business owners, how they want, like real business owners, not, not just the rentiers, like not the Elon Musk of the world, but the people who, in their attempt to control society, don't want you to see them. Don't want you to know them because they have more freedom if you don't. Is that not a hint that maybe Marx really is on to something? Nail it down. I'm going to thank my patrons because I have to be a petty proprietor here, alienating uh, from my own. <laughs> don't want to alienate my own base uh, for what they pay for. It's the irony of this kind of education, and it should, it's an irony. It shouldn't be lost on anyone. Um, I would like to thank uh, patron Joseph M. for making this possible, and all my uh, Khan Okahanan patrons, and all my patrons in general. Um, thank you so much for the support. It makes continuing this viable. Um, I hope you do something with this. If I continue to educate you, and we are just repeat the same things we've done as a repetition compulsion, then what does it mean? You know, what does it matter? Think about this when you are advocating things, because this is important. Are people going to get to express themselves and feel validated by what they do or not? And do they have equal say in what they do or not? That is all.